Hello, this is Jeff Rouse at Our Story Studios, and look who stopped to see me. Hi, Jeff. Ned Coppin, Fairmont Area Chamber of Commerce. A pleasure seeing you. Glad you stopped by. Thanks for and, having me. You know, and we're going to have to have you on the show sometime. I think we could work that out. That would be great. You know, and we just got done shooting an episode of Martin County on TV. Would you like to see that right now? That'd be great. Let's take a look. Uh, Lenny here, and today I have the opportunity to visit with Tom Tourville. He's a Fairmont native, and he's written a book that I think is really going to be interesting. Um, Tom, tell us a little bit about, well, first about yourself. Sure. Uh, I'm a native of Fairmont, Minnesota. My family moved here in 1955. My father was a high school science teacher. I left Fairmont in 69 to head off to college, and uh, most of my life I've been in nonprofit management, uh, traveling around the Midwest to different convention visitors' bureaus, chambers of commerce, whatever. Uh, the last 15 years in Spirit Lake, Iowa, 10 of those as the director of the Pearson Lakes Arts Center, and now I'm happily retired. Okay, well, now you've uh, written a book. What's the title of your book? Yeah, the book's called South Central Minnesota Rock and Roll, 1964 to 1977. And why South Central Minnesota? How well, about, what it, inspired you to do that? You know, it's it, and it's kind of one of those stories where I grew up here, and so they, I'm trying. I wanted to go back and remember the rock and roll scene, so to speak, from the 60s and the 70s uh, during my of my youth. And I mean, we're going to be looking at interlock and ballroom, mm -hmm. uh, complete all the rock and roll the ballroom ever had. I'm, I think it's like 99% complete almost. Uh, Fox Lake Ballroom, Mr. C's, Mr. C's Ballroom had different names uh, down at Hands Park. Of course, the Fairmont Youth Center. And then all the various miscellaneous uh, locales in and around South Central Minnesota from Blue Earth over to almost Jackson that had independent rock shows during that period. Uh, in that 17 years, we'll be covering over uh, 1,100 shows featuring 1,200 different uh, rock and roll artists. Well, you mean you'll have examples of those in your book? Yeah, actually, we're going mean, to we'll chronologically list by date, by month, by week, every rock show at those different venues I was just talking about, as complete as I could possibly make it. Thank you to the Historical Society <laughs> and Lenny's help, because their archives are amazing down there. Um, and then the book's gonna have something really special in it, over 420 photographs. So really? you're gonna have a chance to go back and relive your 60s or 70s youth side rock and roll days not just re by reading about it, but you're going to actually be able to see it again because you're going to have pictures of all the bands. Well, now, are some of those performers of that era still around yeah, Southern Minnesota, yeah. or have you been in contact yeah, with them? Yeah, many of them are. Actually, Jerry Clark and Steve Murphy, who, of course, were uh, members of Fairmont's legendary Epicureans, who uh, us, who are music fans, kind of refer to as the Beatles of Den Fairmont. Dennis Tate, was he in that group? Dennis well? also was, was the drummer in the Epicureans. And in this case, Jerry and Steve are wrote each wrote a forward for my book. Oh, really? And then, as you mentioned, Dennis, I don't know where this book would be. I thought Dennis's help and support, because uh, he's the one that built the amazing display for rock and roll at the Martin County Historical right. Society, right. which is just so fitting. And so Dennis has been a huge help and probably even a bigger inspiration to me on, all right, let's time, let's go get this done. And one of the things that I, I like about doing this kind of a book is that um, if I don't, it's lost. You know, right. This this right. kind of information, this kind of history of our of our youthful growing up of rock and roll in the Fairmont, uh, Blue Earth, Sherburn area, if I don't, it's gone forever. I mean, it won't be coming back, so to speak. So I'm real excited about doing this book. Um, it's the 30th book that I will have done. Uh, 29 have been on rock and roll. Really? Uh, very similar to this. Uh, last two that I've done is on the Roof Garden Ballroom at Lake Okaboji, Iowa. Mm -hmm. uh, fourth edition that was updated this last year. And two years ago, the Hollyhock Ballroom up at Hatfield, Minnesota. So I kind of go from Interlochen to Hatfield to Roof Garden, and that's kind of like the trifecta of, of what uh, the history of rock and roll is in this region. You know, I'm amazed at the number of authors that uh, call Fairmont home or are from Fairmont, Minnesota. One that I've interviewed in the past is Ross Bernstein. Yep. You may have heard of him. He's written a number of books. He's a motivational speaker at this point. And I did an interview with him on Hometown Focus back in 2002. Should we take a look at that? Sounds good. Okay, let's do that. Well, moving on, um, Lenny Tweeden from the Martin County Historical Society had a chance to talk with a local author, Ross Bernstein. Let's see what he had to say. 
This is Lenny Tweeden at the Pioneer Museum in Fairmont, Minnesota. Today's history lesson is going to be on winter sports. And we have Fairmont native Ross Bernstein, actually one of my former students, and he's going to give us some information about winter sports. He's done quite a bit of writing. And Ross, um, what can you tell us about winter sports as far as uh, the historical aspect regarding them and what you've been doing as far as writing about sports? Well, first, thanks for having me back. One of my favorite all-time teachers from fifth grade. You were a great Thank teacher. You. Thank you. Well, Minnesota sports, it's, winter sports has a long storied history in Minnesota, as you mm -hmm. know, and I've been able to bring a lot of that to life in my new books, which is really fun. And interestingly, football has the earliest roots in southern Minnesota, and believe it or mm -hmm. not, it came to, uh, first came to Minnesota in Faribault over in Shattuck because one of the... Uh, innovators of the game uh, from the East Coast when the game was just evolving from rugby and soccer, and it was sort of an amalgam of the two games, uh, came to Shattuck to do some post-doctorate work. Uh, mm. He introduced the game there to kind of keep kids interested, and as a result, he wound up moving on to the University of Minnesota, and Shattuck became the first rival for the Gophers. And this is back in the 1860s. But as a result, football really emerged as a real dominant sport throughout southern Minnesota, and it was warmer down here than it was in northern Minnesota, so football really evolved. Basketball has been around since the turn of the century, and the first ever <clears throat> basketball tournament was held in Northfield. And as a result, uh, in fact, the first ever college basketball game was played in Minnesota at Hamlin in 1895, and that was the same year the game was invented. And we're talking peach crates hmm. and soccer balls, and when you scored a basket, a guy had to get up on, the, on a ladder and actually get the ball out of the basket. And baseball, of course, has a, a long history which goes back uh, to the 1850s, 1860s as well, and uh, it's been well documented later years in the Southern Mini League and, and everything else. Hockey, on the other hand, started in northern Minnesota and mm -hmm. trickled down, and as evidenced by the fact that I played in high school, we didn't get an arena until 1986. Uh, it's still making progress, but winter sports has a long history in Minnesota, in, in Fairmont and southern Minnesota. Hmm. Uh, what about locally here? Um, some things that you might have in mind for the future regarding uh, uh, the past sports in, in Martin County, let's say, or Fairmont, anything that you've uh, been thinking about? Well, I'm working on a new book on baseball right now, but it's been fun to get uh, get involved with a lot of the local towns and teams for, for some of the stuff I'm working on. For instance, mm -hmm. my new book on basketball, there's a wonderful chapter on the history of the high school tournament. And Sherburne, for instance, won it all in 1970. Mm -hmm. And that was a real storied event because there's only one class. It was very Hoosier-like from the movie <laughs> Hoosiers where you had the tiny yeah. town beating up on the big city team and, yeah. and Edgerton won it in 1916. There's all kinds of great stuff like that. Uh, so there, there's really a lot of neat things. Like In this new baseball book I'm working on, there's going to be a lot of great historical stuff uh, specifically about Martin County and about our area, and I'm going to be putting a lot of new pictures about the area, courtesy of the uh, Martin County Museum, the Pioneer, as well. So that'll be okay. neat to have that in there, too. Okay, well, thank you. We have quite a few books here in front of us. Uh, is there anything that you want to share regarding any of those specifically? You know what? Um, I'm working on my, gosh, 12th, 13th book. I've just been having a ball. I, I do... Uh, coffee table sports books every year as well as mm -hmm. children's sports books and I'd like okay. to thank guys like you for getting me interested in reading at a young age and now it's fun to be able to do sports biographies. I just did one on Randy Moss and Kevin mm -hmm. Garnett and Dante Culpepper so it's neat to be able to write stuff like that to get kids interested in reading and I'm having a ball. Oh great. What uh, motivated you or got you interested in starting this type of uh, writing? You know it all started back in, in 1990 or 19. The late 80s, uh, I had a silly notion to try and walk onto the Gopher hockey team, and I uh -huh. had a gratuitous cup of coffee, as they say, with the team, and I got cut, and I came back and became the mascot, Goldie the Gopher, oh, okay. and that inspired my first book, Gopher Hockey by the Hockey Gopher, which I assure you uh, won no Pulitzer Prizes, but it was a lot of fun. It was kind of this history of Gopher hockey, this humorous satire from this big rodent's perspective, and uh -huh. it's got me into writing, and now I've kind of, kind of found a neat niche doing this stuff, and... Uh, my last six books have gone bestseller, and I'm just having a, having a lot of fun. Well, great. That sounds great. What about the future? Any new plans or anything different that you have that you see coming up? Well, I'm doing a new baseball book, and I'm also working with a new publisher on developing a new line of children's sports books at the third grade level, which I okay. think is going to be very cool to get kids to promote literacy. Good. Good. Well, um, anything else that you want to add? Thanks for being such a great teacher, and thanks for taking over the museum. This is awesome. I hope people come out and see this and enjoy it, because it's really a cool thing. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is Lenny Tweeten for Hometown Focus. Boy, wasn't it good to see Ross? It was fun. You know, actually, I've, I've seen his books before, and when it comes to Minnesota sports history, um, he's kind of the man. He is. He right. really is. He's right. very, very impressive. What are some of the uh, specific 
things in your book that you'd like to emphasize or tell us about that are, are, are really of interest as far as you're concerned? Take the Interlochen Ballroom, Fox Lake Ballroom, Mr. C's, and uh, the Youth Center, and chronologically, you know, starting in 64 and, and taking it through 77, in the case of uh, the Fox Lake Ballroom, uh, put together, uh, you know, chronologically, date by date, month by month, who all the different rock groups that played there. A lot of fun facts about them. Uh, there'll be, I've got, as I said, over 400 photos in the book, stories that, um, there'll be a rock and roll quiz, there'll be a story on a, probably the biggest dance the youth center ever held, it was a group called Steve Ellis and the really? Starfires, and that was kind of their their, their Beatle, uh, booking of the Beatles, uh, so to speak, and there's a really fun story about my experience with that show. Just a lot of different things. Going back, a, a photo section on all the Fairmont bands, you know, that I can mm. find photos on, and and there'll be actually some really photos, some new photos people never seen before. And uh, I think I've got the first rock and roll show I ever found in Fairmont, at least that I could document. We're going back to 1962 with a group called the Volcanoes, and some really great shots when these guys were 12 and 13. Really, and it, it's mm. some really really fun things. So it's going to be a a true book of uh, kind of like a, as as I was looking at at the the story of this book coming together, it's kind of like a, the town that was built on rock and roll. Yeah. Fairmont it's not it's just not Fairmont. It's a lot about Sherburne because the Fox Lake Ballroom, uh, Teen Town, and and, and Blue Earth, uh, just a lot of different things, and it's it's a fun book. Do you think this area was kind of unique to that, or it, or was that throughout you know, the country? It's it's interesting. Every area had its own particular rock and roll scene. We had three groups out of Fairmont that actually, four groups now that I think of it, that actually made records and recorded and released records, which was pretty rare, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, lots and lots of bands, but very few ever recorded. Uh, but probably per capita, more bands in and around this area. But what changed the story is the volume of the venues. And because there were so many different venues for different age strata. Remember, if, if you could go to the youth center, you weren't old enough to get an interlock. Right, sure. And, and vice versa. If you could get an interlock and you still needed a ride to go over to Sherburne because you weren't old enough to get in there. I mean, it was really various in, in differences. So it's kind of a fun story, the melting together of all this. And I think what Fairmont as a community probably doesn't remember is the amazing rich rock and roll scene that it had because mm -hmm. it forgot about all the places you know that that rock and roll was was held you know that you and i've talked about my favorite one in the book is uh anderson's clothing it actually brought in a rock and roll band i didn't realize put, that put it in the store it. to introduce the men's fall fashions uh in the fall before what, before they came out what year was it i think it was 1973 72 or 73 is a group called the Triad that actually were based between Winnipeg, Canada and uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And they had one of the bigger 45 record releases in Canada at that time. And here they were playing inside the store at Anderson's. When did this era sort of kind of fall off? You know, every, you know, everything kind of stopped really going to rock. I'm going to say about 1977, 78. By 79, that rock had really kind of gone over to country country mm -hmm. music, a lot of the venues stopped booking rock completely, and a few of the, I think the, really the only holdout for true rock and roll bookings continue all the way till literally the ballroom stopped was the Fox Lake Ballroom in Sherburne. Very late to book rock, 1964, which is late by, by music standards, mm -hmm. but once they got a hold of rock and roll, they never let go of it. Well, you know, you've talked about a lot of different things you have and uh, quite a few pictures. Lots of pictures, a lot of photos. So just how large is your book? I mean, how many pages? 134 are pages, uh, pages, 17 okay. years, uh, 1,200 artists, 1,100 shows, 420 plus photographs of photographs and posters and old ads and graphics and logos of bands and pictures of records. Uh, there'll be a section called uh, the top, the top 25. And if you played one of these venues and you did make a record, mm -hmm. it's the top 25 records oh. that came out during that period by a band that played these venues. What would you say is the most unique or interesting aspect of 
your work with rock and roll and the history of rock? It's kind of hard to say. It's been the longevity to get up to 30 books. Uh, <laughs> I've been doing these books since 1976. It's uh, I never had an interest to be a musician. I've never been on stage. I don't want to say I could care less, but it just has never been who I am. But I have a fascination about uh, about music history and, and how this all came about. And I learned about the music business. And there's a whole unique side. This book's a lot about the business, too, mm -hmm. uh, from Elliot and Betty Waterbury, who used to run the youth center oh, sure. when, I was yeah. a, when I was a kid. And actually, I learned so much from Elliot, I put myself through college as a booking agent, really? booking bands. And one of my favorite stories about booking bands was I once booked Bruce Springsteen to play in a flatbed truck behind the student union in Mankato, Minnesota. And when I called him on the phone to get the contract done, he was at the breakfast table having breakfast. And this actually happened then? True as, true as the sun coming up, yeah. Now, why didn't you bring him to Fairmont? You know, it was cost, you know, overall cost. You know, we're talking 1973, sure. and Bruce Springsteen by then was really, really cheap, but not by Fairmont standards, you know. <laughs> Fairmont was more like about a seven, six, seven, eight hundred dollar, five hundred dollar <laughs> band. Bruce Springsteen was more like about a five, six, seven thousand dollar performance that yeah. he did in, the, in that time period in Mankato. So it just really varied. But, you know, Fairmont had some really good acts. Uh, I, in doing this book, I discovered Tommy James and the Shondells uh, played at the Fox Lake Ballroom. Herman's Hermits played at Mr. C's I saw at Hans Park. Yep. And, you know, there's so many fascinating things. Uh, there's a rock and roll quiz in the book. And we talk about some of the musicians who played at the Youth Center. Uh, one was recorded with Bob Dylan and his Blood in the Tracks album. Uh, one was a guitarist with Prince and the mm. Revolution. Uh, one became the music director for Gene Pitney for over a decade around the world in all of Gene, Gene shows. And all those kids at that time as musicians all played at the youth center in their respective bands. Sometimes the story is not about the band, it's who's in the band, who's standing sure. behind and where they became. And all of those kinds of things will be in the rock and roll quiz in the book and it'll be lots of, I didn't know that, and that's kind of what this book's all about, mm -hmm. having some fun and bringing back some memories. Now, if you take the quiz and get them all right, you get a free book? No, I don't know if you get a free book, but you get the, you get the right to say, I passed the quiz. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's a simple true, false, or multiple choice. And uh, uh, I've done that in most of the books I've done, and people just love them. Then there'll be a rock and roll fact section, you know, about each of the venues. And then I've got about four to five page story on the history of rock and roll in South Central Minnesota, how it came to be, when it began, when it ended, why it came, who are the ballroom operators, owners? Why do they even do rock and roll? So that's all part of the book. It's it's kind of there's a there's a real story behind the night you stood and saw the band on stage, the lights, and you heard the, you heard the music. There's a huge story behind that that experience, and a lot of this book will touch upon those those types of things. Boy, sounds good. You know, I did another interview with an author from Fairmont, Steve Winsenberg, for sure. Hometown Focus in about 2004. Should we take a look at that? Wonderful. Let's do that. Welcome back to Hometown Focus. Well, as we move into the present, we get a chance to meet a descendant of a family who were well known in the city of Fairmont and the surrounding area. Len Tweeten recently spoke with Steve Winsenberg, who is a popular author who made a stop in this area promoting his books and also to visit some of the area residents. So let's take a look at this week's report of History Moment. <laughs> Today we're going to visit with Steve Winsenberg, a Fairmont native, graduate of Fairmont High School in 1973. And he's gone on to do a number of different things. He's an author. Uh, he's currently a communications professor at Grandview College in Des Moines, Iowa. And I think Steve will start out and just ask you a little bit about your background and your ties to Fairmont. Kind of think back to the past a little bit. Sure. Uh, the Winsenberg family was in Fairmont for about 100 years, and uh, my great-grandparents were here. My grandparents lived here for many years, and they owned the Winsenberg Elevator, which was one of the main elevators downtown. And my dad was the school district business manager. So for the Fairmont schools, he worked as a business manager. And so I grew up here and uh, lived here until about 74. I graduated high school in 73, went off to college, and then after 74, I just uh, lived summers in college. And so I really have not been back too often, mm -hmm. just basically to visit relatives. And uh, my grandma, the last uh, remaining Fairmont resident, passed away about two years ago. And uh, so that was really the last Winsenberg tie to Fairmont. Everyone else has moved on. Okay, and I see you're, you're an author. You've done uh, some writing. And uh, what type of writing do you do? And how did you get interested in the kind of things that you write? 
Well, much of the writing interest started when I was in Fairmont, and it actually started in radio because uh, when I was in 11th and 12th grade, KSUM allowed us to write a radio drama. Mm-hmm. And it was on every Sunday night, and some of the other people in town, Steve Goodell, Dan Banks, uh, Gary Range, Jane Gardner, uh, we got together every Sunday night and did a live radio drama on KSUM for our senior year. And that led me to getting into broadcasting in college. And uh, from there, I expanded into not just radio, but also doing other things like television, newspapers. I, used to, I did write for the Sentinel for a while when I was wow. here in high school. I wrote for the sports section of the Sentinel. And uh, just ended up, after a number of years in the business, decided to go back to grad school, get my degree, and go into college teaching. And since then, I've been doing both college teaching and staying involved in media, particularly in radio. And at some point during those college years, I decided I needed to not just write articles, because I was doing a lot of articles for magazines, but also needed to put some books together because I was finding that many of the areas I was interested in didn't have books. And so I decided to do the research and put those together. So you're kind of a pioneer in this kind of writing as far as like watching TV talk shows and TV's greatest sitcoms and those kinds of things? Well, in some of the areas, the thing I'm probably best known for is for my research on TV preachers. And that's the original book that I published back in the late 80s. When I was in the University of Minnesota, I did research on TV preachers like Jim Baker and Pat Robertson. Mm -hmm. And then when the big PTL scandal exploded in 1987, many of the viewers will remember the PTL scandal, Mm -hmm. I was the only person who had ever done any research on Jim Baker. And therefore, that started uh, a lot of interest. I was on most of the national talk shows uh, in all the magazines and newspapers. And uh, then that died down after a couple of years, and there really hasn't been a lot of interest in that, even though I've continued my research in that. There hasn't been a lot of interest there, so I had to expand to something beyond just (laughs) TV preachers. Uh And then the next thing was talk shows, uh, and then I expanded it to sitcoms. So uh, the talk shows, there are other writers that have done quite a bit on talk shows. Sitcom book that I just had come out this year is the Mm -hmm. first book of its kind that's come out in about 25 years. So, So in that case, I am doing research that no one else has done. Interesting. Uh, I noticed in looking at your website that you've uh, talked to some of the people that are on these sitcoms from the past, uh, from back in the 70s, 60s maybe. Um, What are some of the interesting things that come to mind in your visits with them, or what are some of the things that stand out? Many of the stars and even some of the producers and writers of the shows I talk to in order to put this book together. And probably the thing that I noticed the most about talking to sitcom stars is that none of them thought they were doing anything of any significance when they did their sitcom. It was just a job. People have said that to me over and over. Uh, from 50 sitcoms, like I had uh, Shelley Fabre and Paul Peterson from the Donna Reed show. Shelley mm-hmm. Fabre also was on Coach, of course. Uh, she told me that uh, this was just a job. She said, I, that I didn't think anybody would be interested. Mm-hmm. Uh, and all these years later, and uh, Mary Ann from Gilligan's Island interviewed her. She can't believe she still has anybody interested in Gilligan's Island after all these years. Greg from the Brady Bunch, same way. They, they're baffled by the idea that uh, somehow there's interest in these shows all these years later. And so that's probably the common thread for the people that I've interviewed. Hmm, interesting. Uh, where do you see yourself going from here as far as writing? Uh, anything on the horizon? Well, I've got a revised version of the talk show book that's going to come out next fall. That's called TV's Greatest Talk Shows. Mm -hmm. And so I've got TV's Greatest Sitcoms, TV's Greatest Talk Shows, and then I'm going to try to revive the TV Preacher book with TV's Greatest Preachers. Now, the question is, can I find anybody who will publish that? (laughs) Because as I said before, there's not a huge amount of interest in that. But uh, since it is the thing that I'm known for, I would like to complete that trilogy. Sure. Um, You've been in Fairmont today. Friday, December 17th, uh, had kind of a busy schedule. What else have you done today besides come here to the museum? I was very excited to talk to a number of school groups. I went to the Five Lakes Elementary School, right? That's the name of it? Right, Five Lakes uh, this, this was not here when I was at Fairmont. Uh-huh. And uh, got to talk to about 150 fifth graders. That was really exciting. They were a great group of kids to talk to. I also went to St. John Vianney since I had gone to St. John Vianney for elementary school and talked to a couple of their school groups. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then I went out to the high school and talked to an English class about writing. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to communicate to the students here that writing can start at a very early age, and it doesn't have to be this super serious research type writing, even though that is important, but just encouraging them to just start jotting things down as they're taking a vacation 
uh, start to write stories about your vacation and, and keep track of things. And the Internet's been a great source sure. for, for kids to start writing, too, since so many of them are interested in, uh, in instant messaging other kids and writing mm-hmm. things and, and exploring, going on blogs and things like that. So it, it's just been a day of encouragement to try to encourage young people to write. Because when I was in Fairmont in school, I didn't have great visions of writing books or being published nationally. But uh, it, it was an acquired thing that came over years, and it just a spark that kind of grew. And so I was trying to get that spark going here. Okay, and we hope we have a lot of people tomorrow for the book signing, too. Uh, if I want to buy your book or somebody out there is interested in buying one of your books, who, how would they go about that? Well, the website for the book is www.greatsitcoms.com. And if you go onto the website, you'll be able to see some sample chapters and also get information. We even have a little trivia section where you can try to answer some trivia questions from sitcom okay. history. And so that's greatsitcoms.com. All right. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Appreciate having you stop and look forward to the book signing tomorrow. Great. And good luck in the future. Thank you. This is Lenny Tweeten for Hometown Focus. Okay, wasn't that great? Steve Steve does a really good job. Yeah, that's, that was very interesting. I had not seen or heard that one before. Did, now, did you know Steve from before? From yes. Before? Okay, yeah, great guy. Oh, yeah. Okay, when is the book released? What's, tell us about the book signing. Sure. Uh, anything else yep. about the book that you can tell The book's us? going to come out on Sunday, April 28th, and it will be hosted at the Martin County Historical Society at 2 in the afternoon. I expect okay. the, the party to run about from 2 o'clock to 3. The book will be available. I'll be available. I'm going to do a short presentation, answer questions. And more importantly, what I'd like to do is invite in any musician who played at Interlock at Fox Lake at the U Center and invite him to come down to that party on the 28th at 2 in the afternoon at the Martin County Historical Society because I want to have what, we, what I'm going to call as a rock and roll autograph party. And it's kind of a chance to go back and remember the great days. And I mean, you've got to remember a lot of these musicians, when we were kids, they were our stars. Sure. We'd stand at the stage and we'd be in awe. I mean, I mean here were the Epicureans. I mean, wow. And uh, I know Steve Murphy and, and Jerry Clark are coming to sign. I've got some, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have a, a good friend who created uh, DG and the Runaways, who had the National oh, Hit, really? Peter Rabbit. And actually, I think they were the second rock band to ever perform at the Interlock and Ballroom. So we got all kinds of people coming in. It'll be a really, really fun day. The book will be available after the 28th of uh, April uh, here in Fairmont at the Historical Society, also available at uh, Bank Midwest, and also at Riverbend Business Products, and in Sherburn at Bank Midwest, and also at the newspaper's office in Sherburn. So those five locations will have the book, hopefully, for a long, long time to come. And so if you're not available to come on the 28th to Historical Society, you can still get the book. Uh, Historical Society will be a special day because all these musicians will be happy to sign and autograph the book. It'll be like a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And the date again is April 28th? April 28th. It's a Sunday. Two in the afternoon? Two in the afternoon, yes. And the title of your book is? Southern Minnesota Rock and Roll 1964 to 1977. Okay, Tom, thank you very much. Thank Look you, forward Tom. to that date, and I'm sure it'll be great. Thank you. Well, that was a great episode. It really was. We enjoyed showing it to the folks. It was great. And we want to thank you for stopping by. Thanks for having me. You bet. And as we share with you the sponsors that made this show possible, remember, it's not just the past but the present that tells our story.